evolution, a deliberate yet subliminal process for all but humankind. We cannot wait. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. He's on the move. Let's go. Hello and welcome. Coming up in this edition, from the moment man flight was finally achieved, a love affair began that has yet to wane. The challenge to travel faster, further and higher has been constant, and our commitment to it through the years has only grown stronger. Visitors to the Chelsea Flower Show found out how plants talk to insects. Researchers there are discovering how plants use scent and colour to attract helpful insects and repel unwelcome herbivores. And the automated teller machine, a better bike helmet and a cordless screwdriver. Space research has led us to some pretty invaluable spin-offs. Where will it take us next? More than 600 schools are using a newly designed computer system to record and monitor pupils' progress. The London Underground has transformed one of its stations into an art gallery for commuters. Rail travellers are being exposed to new underground art at one of the more unusual stops on the tube service. And a case of history repeating itself. A new tram system has been a runaway success with some 16 million passengers. And a host of gases are being released into the atmosphere at alarming rates. This problem has been studied by scientists for many years, but never with the detail an airborne observatory can make. The first test tube foals in Europe have been born, using a technique that could be used to produce genetically modified horses. Ixi and Quixi were created by a revolutionary technique where a single sperm is artificially fused with an egg and monitored for 11 days before being placed into a surrogate's mother. Professor Twink Allen of the Equine Fertility Unit in Newmarket, Suffolk, says the program could have a variety of benefits. It's the first time ever that horse embryos have been kept alive so long in the laboratory. The work could help in the conservation of threatened species and make it easier to breed champions. Instead of making the best mares pregnant and taking them out of competition in the process, the technique relies on the use of a foster mare. An egg is taken from a sedated mare using ultrasound technology and simple suction. It can then be combined with sperm taken from a champion stallion and stored in the deep freeze. The two foals were named after Dr. Zhi Li, an embryologist from China who's helped develop the technique. A crucial element is the way the embryo is grown in the laboratory for so long. Foals like these are banned from racing because international rules governing the sport forbid the use of in vitro fertilization. The medieval building housing the Imperial College at Y in Kent has been a centre of agricultural study for more than 550 years. It has a world-class reputation for research into agriculture and horticulture and has exhibited at the Chelsea Flower Show for more than 50 years. It plans to treat gardeners to some fascinating insights into the conversations between plants and insects. Plants release aromas to attract specialist insects to feed on the plant, pollinate it or protect it from aggressors. It's a relationship in which the plant is clearly in control, says a senior lecturer at the college. Wise researchers will also lift the lid on the secret life of roses. By capturing their heady perfume using suction pipes that draw the scent into special filters, they've been able to analyze when and how roses produce the hundreds of compounds that make up their perfume. The research has other commercial applications. These cockroach enclosures have been partly impregnated with natural plant repellent compounds. Successful compounds can then be incorporated into fragrant smelling household products like floor cleaner. 
The combined research provides invaluable insight into how beneficial insects can be attracted into our gardens and unwanted ones repelled in a natural organic way. The relationship between plants and insects is more than 300 million years old. Researchers say we're just beginning to understand how the chemistry of that relationship really works. Gotcha. Space research is responsible for a range of mechanical equipment we use every day. NASA's need for a tool to take samples from beneath the surface of the moon led to the development of a battery-powered drill. Sensing the utility of that tool, the private sector used the technology for an array of power tools. The cordless screwdriver, the portable vacuum cleaner and battery-powered video cameras and telephones. Seeing the lunar rover used by astronauts to get around on the moon prompted one man to ask if its one-handed driving system could be modified for use by the physically disabled. It could. The Unistick driving system requires one hand on the control to accelerate, turn and brake. Building on NASA's spacesuit technology, the private sector has developed a better breathing apparatus for firefighters dramatically decreasing the number of smoke injuries while allowing firefighters to get further into a burning building and take greater control of the blaze. Technology developed for use on Skylab in the mid-70s has been used to develop the sophisticated smoke and fire detectors found in virtually every home and office, and sensor technology developed for space missions is the seed for a portable automatic blood pressure measuring system and the infrared thermometer which measures your body temperature through your eardrum in two seconds or less. To explore the new realms of space required new materials to keep the explorers safe and those materials have found applications here on Earth. A thin polyester film used on the Echo 1 satellite and then to line Apollo spacecraft and suits was marketed as the space blanket. Originally meant to keep radiation away from the body, the film also works to retain heat radiation by the body, making a perfect lightweight emergency blanket. Spacesuit technology intended to keep astronauts from getting too hot is at the heart of the cool vests used by children born without sweat glands. The vest permits them to engage in normal activities without the threat of dangerous overheating because of their inability to perspire and bicycle helmets, another spin-off from space research. The composite materials of many helmets worn by bicycle racers and pleasure riders are descended from NASA research on polymers and the aerodynamics adapted from airfoil designed to reduce drag on fighter planes. Even the bounce in the astronauts' moon boots found in some types of tennis shoes and abrasion-resistant coatings developed for space equipment now used in scratch-resistant sunglasses. Can you imagine life without computers? They're anywhere you look today. While some developments in microcomputer technology are not direct creations of NASA research, the speed of their development got a boost from use in the space program. The technology used to enhance pictures of the moon is now at work in magnetic resonance imaging. And that, with some astronauts' training programs, is today found in some flight simulator rides at amusement parks. And there's more on the way. Originally created as a flight experiment to grow large three-dimensional clusters of cells during space flights, the bioreactor provides an environment here on Earth where three-dimensional clusters of delicate tissue can be grown outside the human body. Samples which can be used for medical treatment of illness or injury and for medical research on such diseases as cancer or AIDS. An implantable device with just one moving part, which assists a weakened heart until a transplant becomes available, or in some cases makes a transplant unnecessary. A method of preserving blood samples from astronauts in space is the impetus behind the dry blood chemistry method, which permits faster analysis of blood samples on Earth without the need for a bulky, power-hungry freezer or centrifuge.
and work on growing food in space has led to an artificial soil which doesn't need fertilizer. Hence, no need to add fertilizer and no runoff of chemical byproducts when you water your garden. The American space program, from its inception through the Apollo program to the space shuttle and beyond, has met the challenge while leaving a legacy. Technology created for space is developed by the private sector for our use right here on Earth. The next steps along the path are up to you. Above ground, Gloucester Road tube station looks like your average commuter rush hour centre. However, going underground reveals a very different view. The heritage listed station retains its unique architectural features dating from the 19th century and its potential was spotted by British arts charity Candid Art Trust as a superb exhibition space. London Underground was more than happy to get on board with the idea of using the station as a gallery. It goes back to 1865. Jackie Chanarin's twins, reminiscent of both religious icons and souvenir dolls, provoke thoughts of intimacy and privacy, both of which are experienced and guarded on a tube trip. In Louise Watson's untitled piece, she's used materials to mirror images one might see on a tube journey. The steel reflects rail tracks and the semicircular pieces of glass represent railway arches. The tiling at London Bridge and Westminster tube stations inspired the patterns etched in the glass. Rachel Dixon from Northern Ireland wanted to fill her space with chatterings and conversations heard on the tube. Ironically, her piece is entitled Chinese Whisper. The cabling seen throughout London Underground inspired Keith Harrison's work Conduit. His chosen colours relate to electrical wiring, red for live, blue for neutral and green and yellow for earth. The public response to the artworks has been so great, London Underground has produced a leaflet to explain its cultural programme which will sponsor a 12-month plan of art exhibitions. And with a population of 320,000, Croydon is the most populous borough in London, the equivalent of Britain's seventh largest city. In the past 12 months, its new £35 million trams have carried 16 million passengers and covered 180,000 kilometres of track. Operators Tramlink say the system has more than achieved two major objectives reducing congestion on the roads and bringing business into the town. The secret of its success has been in operating a system that mirrors the travel patterns of its users, linking up with mainline railways and other transport systems. Trams start running early in the morning and finish very late, are very accessible to disabled people and those with pushchairs, and best of all, they're cheap. Most journeys cost just under one pound sterling, with the elderly able to travel for free. The passengers are full of praise for their new tram system, saying that it's quick, cheap and very convenient. Fifty years after trams and their infrastructure disappeared from Croydon to make way for buses and cars, these environmentally sound light rail systems have made a comeback. More towns and cities are planning their own tramways, with several existing systems due to be extended, including Croydon's. All in all, the town's tramlink has been a runaway success. Earth's atmosphere. It's the air we breathe, the force that regulates our temperature, weather, and importantly, what cleanses pollutants from the environment. We've begun to realize that our atmosphere has no geographical boundaries when it comes to pollution. Airborne industrial waste in one area can litter forests thousands of miles away with acid rain. Due to our everyday activities, a host of gases such as carbon dioxide and methane are being released into the atmosphere at alarming rates. These greenhouse gases are known to trap heat near the surface of the Earth that otherwise would radiate into space, potentially causing serious global warming. 
This problem has been studied by scientists for many years, but never with the detail an airborne observatory can make, flying at all levels of the atmosphere. To do this, American and Canadian scientists have teamed up to study greenhouse gases in the remote northern latitudes of Canada. The program, called ABLE for Atmospheric Boundary Layer Experiment, is the third in a series of sponsored research expeditions. Initiated in the early 80s, ABLE will eventually study major ecosystems around the globe to better understand the dynamics of our atmosphere. With the help of McGill University, a ground-based site was chosen in northern Quebec that featured a forest and wetlands environment. Scientists from Harvard and the State University in New York built a 100-foot tower at the forest site to sample atmospheric chemistry and collect meteorological data. Meanwhile, NASA's biospherical researcher Gary Whiting and assistant Joel Canez spent countless hours at the nearby wetlands, measuring gases given off by these grass-like sages. Detailed studies of the marsh plant were also made by a group from the University of Delaware to characterize their growth patterns and how they transport methane gas to the atmosphere. Because of their hollow stems, these plants are very efficient transporters of methane, piping the gas directly into the sky. Many other measurements, such as atmospheric balloons, track local winds, temperature and humidity. An Electra aircraft from NASA's Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia flew repeated missions over the sites. Seven experiments took air samples and measured various chemical concentrations. Dr. Ed Browell of NASA's Langley Research Center used an instrument that shoots a laser beam above and below the aircraft to plot a cross-sectional view of the atmosphere. The reddish-orange colors represent regions containing higher concentrations of ozone and other greenhouse gas. Studying atmospheric events from the sky and the ground, giving scientists an unprecedented glimpse of the health of our global environment. Bromcom Computers has a reputation as one of the most innovative computer businesses in Britain. In 2001, they invented a system whereby pupil information is stored into a special folder and is then fed into a central school computer, which is used to keep parents up to date on their children's progress. The system won the Queen's Award for Innovation. Pupils at Kelsey Park Boys School in Beckenham, Kent, are used to their teacher taking the morning attendance register on the computer. Teachers say the e-system has lightened their paperwork load considerably and is having a positive effect on attendance records. The system also helps parents to access the information on such things as attendance, homework and punctuality. Within 10 minutes of being in a lesson, the parents can know that the children are there. The company says that as internet technology develops and increasing numbers of households have access to the web, the current system will develop and become much broader. In the future, the company aims to incorporate webcams and mobile phones into the system. Parents in the future will always be aware of their child's whereabouts. Kitty Hawk, 1903. The success of the Wright brothers put America at the leading edge of aviation. While the Europeans pulled ahead during World War I, that edge was recaptured and maintained by the NACA, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. For 75 years, the NACA NASA team has continued to fulfill this mission to supervise and direct the scientific study of problems and solutions of flight, both inside and outside the cockpit. Dramatic advancements have been made in reducing drag and increasing speed. For instance, in 1947, while piloting the X-1, Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier for the first time. 
and the X5 proved that the variable sweep wing could fly. The X15, tested from 1958 to 1968, was the first aircraft to fly 67 miles high along the fringes of space. Reaching 4,500 miles per hour, it came back to an aerodynamically controlled landing. Inside the cockpit, control panels, once a myriad of dials, have been consolidated into easy-to-read monitors, enabling pilots to fly better and safer. Also helping the pilot are flight simulations. For a while, the only way to get the feel of an aircraft was to fly it. Flight simulators show how an aircraft will perform without leaving the ground. Together with wind tunnel testing and computational fluid dynamics, engineers and pilots have the best information possible before actual flight tests begin. Aeronautic improvements like these led NASA to a blending of air and space. Case in point, the lifting body concept. Half spacecraft, half aircraft, the lifting body achieves aerodynamic lift from the shape of its body alone. Lifting bodies were precursors to NASA's successful space shuttle. Flight experience from many programs has led to the planned X-30, also known as the National Aerospace Plane. This research vehicle will be a true air-to-space machine, taking off like an air-breathing aircraft and accelerating to 17,500 miles per hour into low Earth orbit. NASA's world-class aeronautics program. 75 years of continued achievement in air and space. Thank you.